From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome back to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. And in the news this week, Mayor Emanuel gets his budget. It's a $7.3 billion budget, and it contains, depending on how you look at it, over $60 million in new taxes and fees and fines. But of course, no property tax increases because you know, it's an election year, you know. So the big property tax increases are being held off until next year because it's not an election year. Budgeting 101. So, of the most controversial methods the city uses to fill those giant budget holes is dinging you, dear citizen, with automated red light tickets. And what can you do? They send you a video, right? You entered the intersection on red, they got you, so out comes the checkbook. Well, there's been quite a bit written about the length of Chicago's yellow lights. They've been described as the shortest that the federal law allows, three seconds in most cases. And the Tribune reported that in some cases they're even shorter than that, 2.9 seconds. But WBEZ's Odette Youssef took a different look at the timings and discovered that it's the red lights that may be catching you. They're, they're longer than you might expect, and that could be nabbing loads and loads of drivers unnecessarily. It's called the all red when all four, you know, you know. anyway, Odette's going to explain all that to us. Odette, welcome to the program. Thanks for having Great me. Great to have you here. And Mayor Emanuel did get his budget without a single amendment being offered by any alderman, but will he get his sprawling Lucas Museum on the Soldier Field parking lots? <laughs> Not if Friends of the Parks has its way. Their lawsuit is seeking to move the museum to a different location, and the lawsuit has ignited quite a fireball of controversy. And the igniter of that is Cassandra Francis, who's joining <laughs> us here, president of, the, of Friends of the Parks. Really happy to have you on the show here today. Thank you. Great to be here. I know we've, uh, we've seen you being very public and uh, the <laughs> The, the various forums and everything, and it's been a really fascinating public process to watch. Um, public process is something that we talk a lot about on this show because often it's just nothing more than just charade, but we'll have to have to see. So can we start with you at that because sure. we have a kind of like, almost like a fetish on this show about the red light cameras. <laughs> we talk about them all the time. Yeah. And you actually did some original journalism that brought a whole new chapter to the table about how these red lights work and how they uh, one can dr draw the conclusion and I know you did that they may not be unsafe but you can make an argument that they're unfair yeah so actually th my inquiry really started as an inquiry about yellow lights not mm -hmm. red lights yeah. um, and it started with somebody who lives in the neighborhood where my office is on the far north side of Chicago and uh, he got a red light camera ticket and he thought that he didn't even have enough time to make the decision about what to do when the light turned yellow, much less actually mm -hmm. come to a safe stop. So he, uh, he was very entrepreneurial and he went back and he like took multiple <laughs> videos and he uh -huh. counted frames and stuff like that. And then he looked up the physics formulas that are supposed to go into, ca into calculating how long a yellow light should be. Yeah. And then he sent uh, an email both to me and to Alderman Harry Osterman, who's his alderman, basically laying out his case for why the yellow light is shorter than mm -hmm. would be recommended by engineering standards. So I was fascinated because I don't think it I've got ever you. gotten an email with <laughs> yeah. physics formulas yeah. in it before. Well, I gotta say that yeah. I, I just, <clears throat> just fell in love with this story because it's so geeky and I, I love this stuff. <laughs> because interestingly, I've, I've thought myself sometimes, it's like, you know what, we're all carrying around these iPhones that now run at 30 frames per second, 30 frame video. So all you gotta do is videotape that light and count mm -hmm. the frames and you know yeah. exactly, you can, you can tell down to the 10th, well, to the 30th of a side or whatever it is, 30 frames in 60 seconds. So that's what you guys did. That's what we did. And I, yeah. I found that really interesting, but you also, of course, then r sort of ran headlong into this all red thing. Yeah, so there now we have a yeah. graphic from you. Okay. So maybe while we're talking, we'll just throw this graphic up on the screen sure. so you can keep it in your mind's eye and you know what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So you've got this, let's talk about the top line first. You've got yellow and then you've got this little piece of red, right? right? So that would, that, would be the recommended practice mm -hmm. if you uh, followed what's called a kinematic equation that's uh, been developed over decades really by something called the Institution of Transportation Engineers. Um, and the red light, that red portion is something called the all red. And that is a period of time after a yellow light transitions to the red light where 
it's red in all directions. Makes so, sense. So yeah, it makes sense. It lets if you got into the intersection on the yellow light, gives you a little extra time to finish the turn. Mm. Um, so what you'll see in that top line is that the yellow light is kind of long. It's more than three seconds. We were looking specifically at that intersection where my source, you know, got his red light camera. It's ticket. California and Peterson. California yeah. and Peterson, yeah. um, and the all red portion is really quite small. So underneath that, you'll see another rendering, and that's what it actually was at that intersection. You'll find that the yellow light is shorter. It's exactly three seconds, which is what yellow lights are all over Chicago at intersections where the speed limit is 30 miles an hour. But then that red portion is longer. Altogether, if you add the red and the yellow portions up, they're a little bit different, but they're almost the same. Um, so if you look at that whole total as the amount of total time you have to clear an intersection, it's they're pretty much giving you the same amount of time that engineers would recommend. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they're misallocating that between the yellow and the red. Mm -hmm. So that means if you enter the uh, intersection during that period when it's actually still kind of during the safe period, mm -hmm. but it's turned red, you'll get a ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was an interesting thing because I didn't realize when I was uh, starting this investigation that there was I was going to have to sort of separate out these two questions: yeah. fairness versus. It's safe, really safety. it's really interesting because I mean just just to be clear, what we're talking about is obviously if you enter the intersection during the yellow interval, you're not going to get a ticket, an automated ticket. Right. You but if you enter when it's red, you will. So if they if the city gives itself another full second to catch you they're going to catch a bunch of people. Yeah, and there have been studies that have uh, looked at if you extend the yellow light by one second, for example, you know, the number of violations goes down quite dramatically. Huh. So, yeah. Huh. <laughs> goes down dramatically, yep. you say. Yeah. <laughs> so here you have a situation where I think it's fair to say that our government, the government that we elect, the uh, officials that we elect, are in the business of trying to stick it to us. They are, you don't have to say that, you're a journalist. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I can say that because I'm a retired journalist. So. But it's, it's really fascinating to see how our elected officials will tax us when they can't tax us other ways. And that's just, it's just the way it is. So, um, as you point out, it's not necessarily less safe. It's right. just, one could argue, less fair. That's right, yeah. And so, you know, I, I finally got response from the city. Um, I had given them a good two months to get mm -hmm. back to me on uh, how they actually program their Did traffic you signal. Them? I FOIA'd them. Let me guess, it was burdensome. Uh, actually, I got no response. Oh, no uh, response. Yeah, I got okay. no response. And so then I, I had to get the uh, Public Access uh, Counselors Bureau from uh, Lisa Madigan's office involved. And finally, they did uh, send me sort of a written response um, weeks after the story aired, um, basically um, saying that, you know, they, they they disagreed with the equation that I used. The thing about that equation is that um, it's been developed over decades and depending on how many engineers you talk to, and I've, I spoke to many, um, you know, some of them will say, oh, well, you don't really have to factor this in. Some of them will say, oh, you don't really need to use this variable, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So the city really does feel, I think, that the way that they're doing it is, is correct, but, um, well, you know. it, it's correct, but it's at the absolute rock bottom minimum. I mean, the the, the standards and, and our, our website, chicagonewsroom.org, will feed you to Odette's story if you want, or you can just go to wbez.org and get it there. It's really worth seeing. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, there are there are ranges of standards, uh, uh, the federal standards and the and the highway, you know, all the highway geeks, the engineers have over the years developed all these standards, and they've said if the intersection is this size and it has this many lanes and the speed limit is this, you get this gigantic formula. Therefore, the yellow light should be this length and this length, and and we recommend a range from this to this. Mm -hmm. And the city of Chicago says we are within standards. Right. We are at the tenth to the tenth of a second. We are at the rock yeah. bottom of yeah. that standard. Yeah. And we do that because if we raised it a little bit more, we wouldn't be able to ding you with our automated camera. Well, I won't go so far as to say that. But, yeah. <laughs> that's, again, <laughs> that's, that's the extra step, <laughs> which you don't have to do. Uh -oh. <laughs>
<laughs> hey, judge for yourself, okay? We just present the facts. We, what is it? We report, you decide. Is that, is that what they say? <laughs> anyway, um, Odette, great piece of reporting, and I, and I think it's really worthy of, uh, uh, of people reading it if they haven't already. So Thank I you. hope they will. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you begin? Where do we begin? <laughs> I, I'll tell you where we could begin. Um, I got into a protracted Facebook debate over the weekend that took up a lot of my time because I had the temerity to um, repost Blair Kamen's fine piece that he wrote on, I think it posted on Saturday morning, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the Lucas Museum being just a fine museum and maybe we need it in Chicago, but we just don't need it exactly there. And why don't we move it like, what is it, a quarter of a mile across the a street and just south, of, <laughs> yeah, just south of McCormick Place right. into the marshalling yards. We'll talk more about that later. And um, lots of debate erupted from that and a lot of a lot of people believe strongly that um, there's really no reason why we can't build the Lucas Museum right there on those parking lots because those parking lots are, you know, not exactly attractive and all that. I saw you at a forum uh, broadcast live here on Can TV. Many things okay. like that that you should check out on Can TV, um, where you said essentially, no, never, not under any circumstances. You build it on the lakefront, we'll stop you. We'll do everything we can. And I got to say, um, that sounds like a perfectly logical position to me. Well, we clearly um, feel strongly about that. And this is an issue where uh, the concept and I, what I would call a fl flawed argument that they are just parking lots uh, is something that we want to try to revisit because they are very, um, they're revenue producing, they are very actively programmed. They were sold um, by the Chicago Park District when they were being built as part of the Soldier Field Project as useful and very viable um, ongoing uses. We like them because they continue to provide open space in that area because once you put a building in that location, it will be forever precluded, especially a building that um, is very iconic and uh, single purpose uh, designed. Uh, it will be very difficult for that space to, to revert back to open space in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, I, I think, one of the central arguments is that sometimes we get into these, you know, these brouhaha's. We're, we're always arguing about something in the city of Chicago. And, you know, they, they have a lifespan of a month or two and then it's done. But every once in a while, one of these comes along that creates a legacy that will live for generations beyond. And it needs a little bit of extra thought before before the city council rubber stamps it. Right. And that is uh, that is something that I think you've brought up here that's really critical to this. It's like, do we need this museum? Yeah, I think you could make an argument that it's a fine a fine addition to the constellation of Chicago museums. I'm I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. But aren't there places that? that we could we could think of that would be more stimulative to the neighborhood around them and that would actually be better for George Lucas than sitting it on top of this parking lot. Well, that's really our point. So our, our main, you know, the genesis of our uh, position is really opposing the site on the lakefront. We are thrilled that Mr. Lucas has chosen Chicago as the site for this museum. I mm -hmm. um, think it can be very, very additive. But the point you bring up, which is that can it also be additive to the neighborhood and the site that it is delivered to, mm -hmm. um, is a very good point because it can develop, um, you know, significant economic development benefits in a neighborhood. And on the lakefront, uh, we are living in, um, a wonderful time when there is still open space on the lakefront, controlled and with public access, mm -hmm. because for over a century, our forefathers and city visionaries have been protecting the lakefront. In 1973, the Lakefront Protection Ordinance, this is over 40 years, um, was kind of the local um, embodiment of what we call the public trust doctrine, which is really what's impacting this. So there are still some very open wounds about what happened in Soldier Field with the addition and some other projects, including McCormick Place East. That's a good example because we'll be fighting about that as long as Chicago <laughs> sits <laughs> on the lake. That's right. Our grandchildren it, will be fighting about right. it. I've got a question actually. So mm -hmm. from what I'd been reading about mm -hmm. it, the lawsuit wasn't actually citing a lakefront protection ordinance, but something about reclaimed waterways. Is that right? So it's, it's actually, yeah. it's all tied together. 
So some people have said it's a departure, um, and we were focusing on the lake from protection ordinance um, prior to filing the lawsuit, particularly because it's easy to understand. It's a city ordinance, and it is very clear in how it describes what should be done and should not be done on the lakefront, including a specific preclusion for any further private development east of Lakeshore Drive. It's just it's black and white, you know, trying to maintain open, natural, continuous nature of the lakefront. Um, it is the, the Lakefront Protection Ordinance is the local embodiment, again, of what we call public trust doctrine, which is a, goes back to Roman times, it's international um, law, but it's certainly um, a federal um, concept now. And in this case, it protects the, the use of the lakefront, particularly because it was reclaimed land, or it's land that was reclaimed from um, the lakefront. So it is absolutely documented to be in the public trust, public trust ownership. Um, it didn't exist. Um, and the state of Illinois is the arbiter of what is a public benefit relative to that public trust, because they are, in fact, the trustee. So the concept is then the city and the Chicago Park District don't have the authority to uh, dedicate that land, even though they may, in fact, own it. The use of the land is actually arbitrated by the state mm. f for the benefit of the public. And it's not just Chicagoans. It's also any citizen in the state of Illinois. So uh, let's just get something straight about you. You're just some goo goo, right? You're just against all development. You don't like development. Of any no, kind. I actually personally um, am very pro development. Um, I come from a construction and real estate development background. Um, but that, and I'm an urban planner as well, in full disclosure. The idea, however, that the spaces in between the built environment, particularly now when we are starting to see tremendous growth in our city, um, and I brought some, some figures to show that between now and 2040, CMAP's updated um, figures from last month, over 850,000 more people living in Cook County and over 350,000 jobs, actually 400, over 435,000 jobs coming to downtown. We hope they're well, right. That's right. And I, I really would defy anyone we to say that that's not the right. case because yeah. we do hope. Yeah. But if all of that activity comes downtown, everyone's gravitating to cities. This is Cook County, but um, many of, most of that will come downtown, either for work or for resident. There's going to be not only greater pressure on, you know, for developing some of these open mm -hmm. spaces. They're very, they're a lot easier. People have to yeah. work a lot less hard to say there's a green space over there we yeah. could build in it. Um, but the demand for the use of open space for recreational purposes is going to be that much more important. So the, fi the fight is even that much more critical right Correct. now that, the, that mm -hmm. these things have to be. So done. the precedent setting now of a new building on open space and letting, mm -hmm. emasculating the Lakefront Protection Ordinance and Public Trust Doctrine and this lakefront, mm -hmm. if we let this one happen, it could very well um, lead to shoreline sprawl. Yeah, I want to tell you, to get almost sort of personal about this for a moment, I've, I've been another one of these kind of like, you know, NRA level, absolutely not, never, now, never, ever, under any circumstances, end of discussion, go mm -hmm. away. I've been one of those people. But you know what? They had me wobbling on this one. Uh -huh. They really mm -hmm. did. Because it's like, if you look at that, if you look at that piece of land, it is despoiled for all time. Mm -hmm. It will never be anything attractive. It will always be this worthless parking lot that's used, you know, a few hours a month. And if we could redevelop that with something that would be an asset to the city and not pay for it, you know, there's a real argument for it. It's okay, I came back in the reservation, but I think this is where a lot of people are at right now. And that you said you've, you got, had a, you've got a real emotional issue on it's your very hands. Very true, here. and mm. it's a complicated issue. It's complex for many people. Um, your point kept me busy, very, very busy over the weekend on Facebook because um, we were uh, retweeting all of these articles in the, the Chicago Tribune's editorial from last week, as mm -hmm. well as um, the uh, George and Vicki Ranney also came out supporting this project as mm -hmm. well now. It's not just an ugly parking lot. So that's the first point, is that it is, it's very useful. I am not here to defend parking lots, although I do think in some cases they do help people access parks. However, um, if we're really going to do something there, let's green it. I put on our Facebook page many different pictures of parked, you know, parking areas that are completely green. You'd never know it was not a park when the cars are not there. How about Millennium Park as an example? Well, you could do, <laughs> now underground here gets a little bit difficult <laughs> yeah. because of the contamination in the water yeah, table, yeah. expensive. Um, but that's the first point really. We could make that a very green location and we can use it for many other things. The presidential helicopter lands there, there are circuses there, there are BMX uh, events there. 
Um, it can be used for many different things. And you don't have the reparation with asphalt, but even if you would properly design green um, parking area, the kind of reparation issues you have with Lollapalooza, where the public mm -hmm. was not able to access that park right. for a month and a half. The second thing is, if we really want to talk about ugly parking lots, I've got one down at 31st Street, just mm. a little bit south, <laughs> that that's really ugly. <laughs> and, and it's you, on the lakefront. It's, it's closer the lake to the lakefront front than this one is. And if you put a deck on that, yeah. you've got a much better view yeah. of the lake. So. Yeah. I'm wondering about this whole question of the public benefit standard, because I, you know, what if they were to say, and you can correct me, if this is only about use of open space, then... No, it's I'm, not. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a broader... Answer. Okay. So, I mean, what if they were to say, if you're a City of Chicago resident or something mm -hmm. like that, you get in for free, or you get in And they for, do. The okay. museum campus has a stipulation for any of the museums that you have to have, I think, at least 50 days a year. Now, some of the museums do bunch all of those free days to February and January mm -hmm. when um, it's not the most convenient um, time to go to a museum. But that is a public benefit. The design, as it was um, put forth, has a public access for an observation deck. You know, you could argue that's a public use. When you go back to the Lakefront Protection Ordinance, there is a clause in one of the, one of the 14 kind of standard goal or overreaching uh, goals actually defines what they think, gives us a signal to what they think is public. And the two uses that they mention are a port and a water treatment facility. These are things that are not only absolutely clearly um, beneficial to the public, but they also have this other feature that they kind of need to be on the lakefront. Mm -hmm. So the argument of why a iconic museum that really we're thrilled it's in Chicago has to be on the lakefront when there's no windows in a place that we already have way too much traffic congestion um, is something that I think is a challenge. And their argument is we want to be in there, we want to be on the lakefront, we want to be in a campus environment, um, we want to be in with the energy of all these museums. Mm -hmm. One of our challenges is let's extend the museum campus to right. the south, across right. the Stevenson, west of the expressway, or west of Lakeshore Drive. We are, we're thrilled with that site. It's a site that's already a targeted priority development site by the city, mm -hmm. Michael Reese Hospital. Mm -hmm. And the marshalling yards can be decked and the marshalling operation, truck marshalling operation can still happen underneath. We did do a study during the Olympic um, village period. Um, that that operation can happen. So the mm -hmm. arguments I've heard against those sites, um, and I do have a bit of a history with that site and some knowledge, uh, have all been ones that I'd love to challenge. So yeah. whether it's yeah. expensive, there's too much environmental contamination, <clears throat> that it doesn't connect to the street grid, all those things are probably less expensive to deal with at 31st Street than they will be um, at uh, the proposal case. And, and the, the marshalling operation, I've never seen this actually dealt with, I've never seen it dealt with, but it would have seen, seemed to me that it would operate just as well under a deck as it does out in the open. It would also be and a lot less have, ugly. Would be, apart from that, I mean, uh, yeah, but I mean, even operationally, there'd be, there wouldn't have to deal with snow and ice and mm -hmm. it would just be a better operation underground, right. well, not underground, but under deck than, right. than it is now. The two challenges are really the column spacing for turning radii. Yeah. We got around that issue in the plan that we did, uh, and also the fact that um, you need to ventilate once you enclose. Of course, but you have right, the metro right. tracks to the west right. as well, so this right. could buffer. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's important about a deck in that location, which is a an element of all four, actually five of the plans that have been done in the last decade, is that that would be decked with the marshalling operation underneath because it allows a connection, a pedestrian connection from Michael Reese Hospital exactly, right. to the deck Across and over the tracks, to the right. But I mean, I I you could get even weirder with it and say, while you're doing this decking, let's take it out over half of Lakeshore Drive. I mean, it's not exactly a picturesque piece of Lakeshore Drive right south of McCormick Place anyway. Deck that all over, and then mm -hmm. he's on the lakefront. That's right. He's and literally and on the lakefront. And that's really adding green space. Right, yeah, it's adding lots of green space. Right. And, as you say, it ties into the Michael Reese property, which then makes that a much more attractive Absolutely. piece of property. And our mayor just goes on and on and on about his uh, um, stadium that he wants to build for DePaul and the entertainment center that's going to kind of head kind of out from McCormick Place. Right. Well, all of that can tie in together. Absolutely. And Bronzeville and, and the Blues District. And, and the, the 31st Street Harbor. 31st Street mm -hmm. Harbor and even Motor Row. I mean, Absolutely. all of this stuff is all kind of poised to get knitted together, and this could be the thing that ignites it. Absolutely. So why aren't we doing it? 
it seems very obvious. So, um, and I, I also think that there's probably um, some other challenges there because I've even seen some plans there, and we talked about this during the Olympic period, uh, where McCormick Place East goes away. Now, mm -hmm. if you can imagine that entirely yeah, right, natural space right. as well, it's an obsolete facility. Mm -hmm. um, the Randy's article and, and Blair Kamen's article um, also indicate that that should be something that should be considered to be moved. And during the Olympic period, it was something that was on the table. Well, it, yeah. if it needs to move, then maybe we get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So it was clearly considered, and the concept that could all be beautiful, open, natural space, as opposed to a parking lot, right. is something, let's go out and spend this time and this uh, legal yeah. money trying yeah. to raise money for that. And I, one of the other things that we got into in our little debates over the weekend is, you know, if there's anything that Chicago knows how to do better than almost any other city, it's decking over stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, all of Illinois Center, the, the Millennium Park, Millennium everything Park. is all built over railroad tracks and roads and everything else. Exactly. And look, we, it's, it's worked out pretty well. We Absolutely. know how to do it. Every 30 years or so, you got to strip everything off and put a new roof on it. That's but, right. Know, that's that, that's a small Burr. price to pay. <laughs> and oh yeah, so you mentioned beforehand. Let's just let's just um, go go off the tracks mm -hmm. for a second here. You've actually been in Maggie Daly Park. You've we actually walked around in it. Yesterday, I'm we jealous. did a hard hit tour of Maggie Daly Park with the Park District. And part of what we were really doing is, um, first of all, just seeing it. We are receiving a lot of calls because it's a very visible construction yeah. site now, yeah. and there are some very large elements going up. So we wanted to kind of get our own view of it. And with some of my board members, we um, toured the entire site. It's, to, it's scheduled to open up in three and a half weeks, I believe. Is it really? It is, and this is the skating ribbon and everything. Yeah, they're going to open the, ice skate they're they're gonna open the skating ribbon this year? They are. Now, it may not, so three, three and a half weeks. Not all of the park may be opened, but wow. most of it will. The parts that wouldn't be open will not impact kind of a very strong opening. Because so they, didn't, they didn't get all this, the landscaping done this year because of the weather. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So the two points I would make on um, the park, um, um, and I've had, you know, uh, my phone ringing off the hook with people saying they love it. Some people saying, what are those big white tarantulas out there? Mm -hmm. uh, because they are very visible. And the, and the timber structure that went up on the corner, um, the southeast uh, corner of the park, uh, has certainly um, caused a share of calls. But I, I really think that we need to wait until there's a spring season where yeah. the leaves run the trees and the trees grow a bit because I think the elements will look smaller. We were very excited about everything that we saw there. Mm -hmm. The scale, while big, is something that I think um, the site can handle yeah. once the trees come in. And the adjacency so. to Millennium Park and the Absolutely. bridge and all that. So you guys aren't just opposed to everything. No, then. not <laughs> at all. We really, I, th I think we were pleasantly surprised. That's and once good. you actually get on the site, um, it is a wonderful feel, and it, the scale the yeah, scale works. Yeah, yeah. Well, w this is an ongoing conversation. It's going to be carrying on for the next couple of years, I'm sure. So uh, we'll. Uh, I'd love to have both of you back for various reasons to, to come and talk about this and many other things. Great to have you both on the show for the first time today, Odette. Uh, congratulations! Nice piece of work. Thanks and for having we'll me. We'll be following you on all of what you're doing. And Cassandra, same to you. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, I guess it's fair to say good luck with this. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if we can or not, but you know, hey, that's what's going on. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV, and you can see us here anytime you want. But if you go to this address, you'll be able to watch us or listen to us anytime you want. It's up to you because it's all about you. And we'll be back next week with another show. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks very much. And, well, actually, next week it's, it's our Thanksgiving show. It's going to be a compilation of the fracking stuff we've done. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, thanks. See you next week. Bye.